Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Ball Sports, and uh, I saw this week that there was a lot of interesting controversy uh, about the uh, quarterback at the University of Michigan. His name is Devon Gardner, and Devon uh, recently was interviewed uh, by the Detroit News, um, and he mentioned that he's been called the N-word many, many times this year, um, and it happens to be because there are a lot of frustrated fans in Michigan because it seems like they're officially having one of the worst seasons they've, they've ever had, but uh, we know that going that deep deep and, and making those kinds of um, insulting remarks is clearly unacceptable, uh, especially when you're talking to a young person. And uh, one uh, fellow scholar, a uh, fellow scholar soldier, uh, that, that's what I call uh, black scholars who uh, step in when they're needed, uh, is Dr. Jahari. Well, I said Dr. Jahari Shuck, but she's Jahari Shuck, but she will be Dr. Shuck. I call her Dr. Shuck because I know that's what she's going to be very, very soon. Um, she's getting a PhD in higher ed, but more specifically, she has uh, a, a developing, very powerful expertise on the state of the black male athlete um, at the college level. So she's someone who can really speak to this. She also happens to be a graduate of the University of Michigan, so she can speak to, uh, to this issue from an intellectual standpoint as well as a personal standpoint. So the first thing I want to say is, um, how you doing, Jahari? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. It's hard for me to call you Jahari because I always call you Dr. Shuck. We just I, I, I'm I, I, in jest, and, 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 I, and I'm, I always have to be careful about that because sometimes if you if, if, if one of your advisors catches me calling you Dr. Shuck, I don't want them to get mad at you and say, "Well, I'm not going to give her her PhD to teach her a lesson." So I, I we're not we're not going to assume anything. You're, you're you're doing great in your program. You're almost done. Um, but it, but I know personally, I respect your expertise on this. And you brought this to me. You mentioned uh, what was going on with this brother um, at Michigan, which. Uh, uh, you, as you can imagine, I was uh, clearly disappointed by this kind of behavior. He says he's been harassed on social media uh, with, with with these ugly letters that he's receiving and emails and all this other stuff. And you had a strong opinion on that. Uh, you know, what is your take on this as far as what what's happening to this guy? Yeah. Um, so Devin Gardner, when I read the article um, a couple of days ago when it came out, it just really disturbs me um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it reminded me of, I don't know if you ever saw the um, 30 for 30 about the Fab Five and, yeah. and how uh, they received a lot of mail uh, that had a lot of racially uh, charged uh, statements in them. You know, they were called the N-word frequently. Um, so it reminded me of that. Um, and it made me think, like, during that time, what did the university do? How did the university help the students deal with the fact that, you know, these are really young men, young people who are just figuring themselves out. They're, you know, struggling with their identities on multiple levels, right? So they're trying to figure out who they are as athletes, who they are as college students, who they are as black men, because that's their reality. So they're dealing with all these different pieces and uh, conflicts. Um, so it's like college is supposed to help students, you know, negotiate all these developmental um, experiences that they have in college so that they can, you know, acquire certain skills, competencies, whatever. Um, and so my question was, what did the university do to kind of help these students deal with this issue that is, you know, basically attacking part of their identity, you know? Um, and so it made me really wonder how Devin is being supported by the institution. Um, yeah, that's that's just the tip of the iceberg. I can go on and on. Well, no, I, I, and I, and I want to go deeper on that iceberg. And, and, you know, because I can say that as a person who graduated from college in 1993, that was when I finished. So I kind of came out around the same time as the Fab Five. I am astonished when I see just how little things have changed since I was in college. It's not that much different, you know. Um, and now, you know, my, 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 my kids and God kids, they're all about that age. They're all about college age. And, you know, so I visit them on campus all the time. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, wow, it's amazing how things are so similar. Uh, also, when you look at certain demographics um, as it relates to diversity in terms of faculty hires, student admissions, things like that, um, not only are the numbers have the numbers not gotten better, but in many cases they've actually gotten worse. So it almost seems as though uh, that same sort of exploitation of the black athlete, we love you to death when you can make us money, but we don't care about you in any other capacity. It seems like that still continues. I mean, is that kind of what you're seeing here? That that they sort of they're sort of looking at this inward thing and saying, well, you know, that it comes with the territory, just deal with it. 
Yeah, and I kind of want to, you just hit on something, and I want to make a quick digression, um, because I had an interview, so I'm doing my dissertation about former um, black football players and their college experiences, and um, I spoke with someone today who basically said the same exact thing, like, I was a player, I was a black football player, and they didn't care about me as a person. I mean, this individual um, had uh, trouble with the law before he was, I mean, he was heavily recruited, not just by Michigan, but by big powerhouses. But he, you know, had a difficult upbringing and he got in, tr in trouble with the law. And he was saying that when he got to Michigan, they knew this information, but they put nothing in place to help him deal with the issues that he came to the table with. He felt that they just brought him there to win them games, you know, to contribute to that. And he was not looked at as who he was, if that makes any sense. So it does happen. This happened back in the early 2000s. Now this is 2014. So the, with the Devin Gardner situation, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the same thing where, you know, do we care about these young people as people uh, it looks like not all the time and so i think in this situation like the university the athletic department the coach they need to step up and make a really powerful statement that you know we don't tolerate racism like make a stand against racism because that's clearly what all this is about and because you know it doesn't look good sometimes, uh, a lot of times, the way that uh, black athletes are portrayed in the media, the way that they're treated in college. Um, and they're not all victims, and I'm not trying to convey that, but we all know that there's a level of exploitation that goes down. And it's because, I mean, race is all over that. So I'm kind of going on, but there, these are different examples of how the system is just really... Um, reflective of society and racism and it's really coming out now um it's been going on like i told you before it's been going on since the first black football player played at michigan back in 1890 so i mean things kind of change but a lot has stayed the same well you know and, and it's not just a matter of picking on michigan per se um because we know that a lot of programs around the country have their issues but um, you know, if you specifically talk about Michigan, I mean, they've had some other scandals that relate to uh, just sort of sending a signal that uh, the well-being of athletes is not their top priority. I mean, even this year, they had some issue with um, with a concussion scandal, from what I understand, uh, with, with, with one of the quarterbacks getting a concussion. And when the governor of Michigan was asked about the concussions, he said, he basically said, I have nothing to say. Uh, you know, it's I'm, I'm the governor. It's not my job to get involved with Michigan athletics. But it's so interesting to me because uh, you'll see when it's convenient for politicians to weigh in on sports, they're, they're always glad to do that. They're always glad to tell you who, who, who they think is going to win. Or, or in, in many cases, um, the NCAA is improperly regulated because many of these politicians love their favorite sports team so much that they'll let them get away with whatever, any kind of abuse against the athlete as long as they're on the field. Um, and also what's interesting to me, too, is that, uh, you know, again, when it's politically convenient, you'll see a politician weigh in on some tiny issue that he or she may not otherwise be involved with for example president obama may step in if like when rush limbaugh was uh was called a nasty name or rush, rush limbaugh called a woman a nasty name over birth control pills he he called the woman on the phone and took the time to talk about this one issue but you know but yet when it comes to things that maybe involve um college athletes uh, and particularly black athletes but not just black athletes it almost seems that they're they're very hands-off uh, when it comes to issues that involve athletes' rights, but very hands-on when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, supporting their favorite team, getting their tickets, and, and all these other things. I mean, do you think that that's what kind of happens, that maybe they're just so, um, almost if you think about, like, race horses, you know, if you're so excited about the horse races, you, you just want the jockeys to do, or and the trainers to do whatever they need to do to get the horses on the field. They got to dope them up, that's fine. They got to abuse them a little bit, hit them with an iron rod, that's fine. They don't care, right? Because they're thinking about the big show. Do you think that maybe there's a little bit of that kind of animalistic treatment of athletes that uh, that ends up causing uh, the athletes to pay a huge price for everyone else's entertainment? Um, 
Yes, I do. Um, but the way that I look at it is um, not necessarily from the like physical standpoint and like what I can do for you as a you know an athletic being, but I think that by failing to empower um, these young athletes um, with letting them know that there is more to life than their sport, um, that that doesn't happen consistently. And um, I think that's the problem. So when you don't, you know, put forth options, when you don't encourage athletes to take challenging courses, which we've seen at North Carolina, that's a whole nother <laughs> uh, situation. But, you know, when you're, when you're devaluing, when you're giving these students a devalued education, like that is another form of exploitation and that's happening too often. Um, so I think that that's my biggest beef with the whole situation. Um, you're not building up any other identities besides the athletic identity. And we all know that that's a fleeting identity. But, you know, if you're if you've been socialized to hold on so tightly to it, once that's gone, you're going to have difficulty, you know, trying to figure out what your other identities are. So the whole um, the whole issue really is helping students develop their identities in college. That's a big part of the college experience. Um, and so I, I think that universities can do a better job of helping that process along rather than focusing solely or, you know, mostly on the athletic identity, because that's the problem that um, ultimately faces the athletes once they leave college. Because, you know, like 1% of them will go to the league. So that's a lot of athletes that are not. So that transition is what um, they need help with. And that's the piece that's really um, sorely missing. Mm. Well, you know, um, I, um, I first of all, I agree with you um, I, I, in everything you're saying here. And I think it's important to have these conversations because I think young athletes have to be counseled on um, – on how to really get the, the appropriate salvage value from the skills they pick up as a college athlete. I mean, you know, we'd be remiss not to say that um, that being a college football player, or basketball player at a place like a Michigan or an Indiana or an Ohio State or whatever, uh, that that doesn't make you a pretty extraordinary person. Oh, you know, wow. you have to be the creme de la creme. You have uh, certain... Um, you have certain uh, functions, uh, brain functions that uh, exceed other human beings. I mean, you have the ability to, uh, you know, your, your cerebral cortex can dominate your, your amygdala and your limbic system when it comes to performing at crunch time. So you, you have the ability to perform under pressure in front of tens of thousands of people, millions of people on TV. Uh, you have obviously the intellect to understand complex offensive schemes. You've got, uh, you know, uh, the, the work ethic that comes with being um, – at, at a level of athleticism that has a small margin of error. I mean, when you get to that point where you're competing against some of the best athletes in the world, it's hard. You know, I mean, you can't you can't just go out there off of raw talent most of the time. I mean, you've got to work your butt off to get there. So there are a lot of transferable skills that athletes pick up, uh, you know, when they get to the college level. They can easily translate into – a ton of other things that they could do in life. So the idea that these individuals might walk off the field with no identity other than sports is kind of unbelievable. Um, it's it's uh, maybe uh, I'm trying to think. Maybe you can compare it to somebody who says, you know, I I was a computer programmer at Facebook for ten years, and Facebook laid me off. Now I don't have anywhere to go because Facebook won't hire me. But wait a minute, you're you were a computer programmer at Facebook. Right. You can go work for Google, Yahoo, you know, all the, the right. Netflix. You can, you know, there are a ton of places you could take that skill and be very successful. So why are you so focused on the fact that Facebook won't let you back in the building that you can't see all the other things you could do with those skills? Um, that, that work ethic it takes to become a great athlete can be applied to becoming a doctor, lawyer, business owner, all these other things. And I think Dave Durison was a great prototype of that uh, who played for the Chicago Bears but before he died Dave Durison was a straight A student he was you know an academic all-american but he was also NFL man of the year won Super Bowls and all these other things then he became a successful business owner after he played now the shortcoming which I'm actually going to get to that a little bit because I think we have to talk a little bit about the, you know just how concerned uh, these sports 
teams are with the long-term well-being of athletes. Dave Durison also, for full disclosure, happened to kill himself because he had so much brain damage from taking all those hits to the head that he couldn't sleep. He, <clears throat> excuse me, he was having hallucinations. His brain was literally suffering early-stage Alzheimer's, and that's kind of a common problem. And so. Uh, when I read about what happened with uh, Michigan and the concussion incident, I think about the Dave Durisons of the world. Also, when you can go deeper into Michigan, I think a couple years ago they had a, a whole scandal about practice hours where the coaches were saying, okay, these are the formal hours that – this is the formal time limit that the NCAA gives you, but you're going to go above and beyond that. So you kind of have this sort of coercive abuse. And it's not just Michigan. We're not just picking on Michigan. It happens at a lot of campuses where because there is no oversight, coaches put – athletes in these pressure cookers where you are pushed and, 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 and really trained, brain, almost brainwashed to believe that all that matters is sports. And, as you, and it goes back to what you were saying about the identity not evolving outside of sports because they have no incentive to, to involve the, uh, evolve the identity outside of sports. They just want to win games. USC, or uh, UNC, I'm sorry, North Carolina Chapel Hill. Just today there was a story that came out where they did further investigation, found out that they were, get, that they were just shuffling their students, their, their student athletes to these cupcake classes so you, you're thinking that you're sending your child to a school that's going to give them a great education when in fact they're there as as a hired gun a, an economic athletic prostitute and that's their only role they're they're not going to let them you know out of that little box and i think that that's a problem uh, so so given i said a lot i know i said a lot of things you know what do you think uh, kind of has to happen how do, how do we fix this i mean we can look to the institutions to do the right thing but they've had a hundred years to do the right thing they ain't gonna do it Right. What, what are the what are the other alternatives? I mean, as, with you being an expert on what's happening with the black male athlete, where do we even start in terms of fixing some of this? Okay, well, I'm glad you asked that. Um, the system, like you said, is not going to change. Um, and and like you said, University of Michigan is not unique. It's not the only school that you know is guilty of doing these things. Um, so because. You know, college sports is so big. It's way bigger than every single kid that's ever played the game. No matter how good you are, the game is bigger than you are. So I think that the only way to really kind of um, affect change in this regard is to educate the students, to educate the young people that are going to be experiencing these things when they hit those college campuses. You know, um, a lot of kids aspire to play pro sports, right? But to get there, you have to go to college. So they have to understand some of the obstacles that they can confront, that might confront them, so that if they do confront them, they'll be able to say, you know what? Someone told me about this, and this is how they dealt with it. So at least they have a reference point versus being completely blindsided and, you know, not knowing how to handle the situation, not knowing who to go to, because that's what happens a lot. You know, they're... they're they don't know who to go to um, if they're running into problems. Um, so that's the biggest thing, in my opinion, is we need to educate the next generation of black, male, and female college athletes so that they understand the gravity of their, uh, their power um, and their position and how all these moving parts can affect their, uh, you know, their aspirations and their goals. And so they just need to understand what, how to navigate the college experience um, when it comes to, you know, playing college sports. They just need to understand that there's more to it, a lot more to it than just being on the field. You know, you're a student, you're a student first, supposedly, right? So a lot of time you spend amongst other students. So, you know, those are opportunities where students have to grow and to develop. So you need to take advantage of that versus being isolated in uh, an athletic facility away from all these other students where you're missing out on some of those important developmental experiences because you have this, this huge commitment to the university um, to playing sports there. So you just th we just need to let them know what they're up against, and there has to be a coalition of people that are, will have their backs and that will speak up for them um, when things go awry. I mean, there's all kind of terrible things going on with respect to um, these young athletes in college sports. I mean, I don't know, I can go on and on. There's a situation down in Alabama with that young lady, um, Daisha Simmons, 
there was an issue with her. I mean, there's a lot of different problems that are going on right now that students need to be aware of so that, because they're all kind of, you know, they could be victim, for lack of a better word, of this experience of playing college ball and not even know what hit them. So. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, it's funny, just, just today we, we held a march against mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex, which which I've always stated as the, the worst thing to happen to black people since slavery. But the second worst thing to happen to black people since slavery, in my opinion, is the NCAA. I think the NCAA is, uh, it extracts about a billion dollars a year or more from the black community every single year. Uh, you, you see just some of the most egregious human rights and labor rights violations imaginable. Uh, so many families are affected, and so much of this reeks of racism and classism and all these other isms um, that that supposedly these liberal universities are supposed to be against but the truth is that you know when push comes to shove and you look at this track record here uh, what you're really seeing is uh, just thousands of black men being shuffled through these athletic programs every year uh, where they walk away with nothing and the university walks away with a check for 20 million that they then spend on a bunch of other people who are middle class upper class whites uh, so again you know it's it's I, I hate putting it that bluntly but that's kind of what's happening I think that in order for us to really leverage and to uh, uh, empower ourselves in the system um, it, you know, I, I would argue I would supplement what you said by saying uh, the empowerment is absolutely necessary, but I just can't imagine a scenario, scenario where the university is going to do any empowering of the athlete. The university is going to empower oh. itself, right? And the athletes oh. and their families have to empower themselves and each other. And uh, that's what the next generation is going to call for. And, I, and I'm optimistic. I think in t the year 2034, uh, it won't be like 2014. I think people are becoming wiser. People can communicate more. If you look at even just what social media does in terms of the transmission of information, this is the uh, first time black people have been able to communicate with each other without having interference or without having to go through a channel owned by somebody else and that's important because uh, how many of these people watching right now would hear from Dr. Jahari Shuk well, I keep calling you doctor but you know what I mean from Jahari Shuk or Dr. Boyce Watkins or whatever if 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 it weren't for the internet right because they're not going to let us talk about this stuff on TV they're, they're not they're not going to invite me to come to a campus to really say what I really want to say about college athletics every now and then I get a chance to do that but not enough to really hit as many people as we want however I, I wrote an article about Allen Iverson and used Allen Iverson as a case study and a prototype of what can go wrong in the life of a black athlete that article got read by half a million people and that excited me because in that article there were just there was just kind of this uh, older black man to younger black man conversation about you know the, 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 these are some of the traps you can fall into these are some of the things that can go wrong this is how you need to analyze the situation so I think that education is occurring slowly but surely and what I really like about scholars like you is that you're educating people outside the classroom and I think that's what every black scholar should be doing so I Thank you for that. I think you're awesome for that. Um, now, I'm going to let you get the last word, Dr. Shuck. Uh, tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, just some of your work and where you're going with it and what your plans are for the future and how yeah. you're going to change the world. <laughs> so I'm, you know, a part of that group of uh, people who genuinely um, care about educating um, young people. I've done it for the past four years at Indiana University teaching um, so that's a passion of mine, and there are um, quite a few uh, more established scholars than myself, scholars that I cite in my papers and my dissertation that are part of um, an organization called the Student Athletes Human Rights Project. And um, this is a group of very influential um, faculty from across the country, um, and we, you know, it, the project was inspired by Harry Edwards, who we both know um, was very important in empowering athletes and getting them to use their voices to try to affect change. So um, we're trying to carry on the legacy of uh, Dr. Harry Edwards. And so um, in conjunction with um, that organization, you know, we're trying to figure out how to uh, reach younger people. So um, that's one thing that I'm working with um, and working on. Um, and then also, just uh, we have an event coming up at, in Chicago uh, to do this very thing to educate um, young athletes in the city of Chicago um, and we're giving them information that they'll need to know if they aspire to uh, play college ball um, so we have a pick we have panelists and 
we have a lot of people that are invested in, you know, giving back to young people by sharing our knowledge about this, you know, college game. Um, so that's coming up and hopefully once that gets done, we'll be doing more of those. So um, that's what's on the horizon. So your student and athlete this, summit that's occurring uh, this, this weekend on, on, on October 25th, um, you mentioned to me that it's at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, what particular room, if somebody really wants to go there like, and wants to figure out where to park and where to walk into, what is it in the auditorium or? Well, we are filled to capacity. I'm happy to say that. So wow. um, I don't have any room, but <laughs> I'm going to um, hopefully, you know, this goes as smoothly as I think that it will. And this will be the beginning of, of more things to come. So I will keep you um, in the loop next time it comes around and uh, we'll get more people involved so that we can uh, educate more kids. Well, I love it. I love it. Well, everybody, you got to go check out uh, Jahari Shuck. I keep calling her Dr. Shuck, and I'm not ashamed to say that, but I don't want to get her in trouble with her dissertation committee, so I'm going to stop doing that in public. Um, uh, uh, Jahari is uh, getting a Ph.D. in higher education. She is an expert on the college experience of the black male athlete and uh, just a scholar that I think you want to hear from because we know how many of our athletes are out here earning billions of dollars with a book, billions of dollars for uh, major universities. That money is not coming back to the black community. Uh, in case you want to know how much money is being made in these sports, uh, the NCAA actually makes more money during March Madness than the playoffs for the NFL and the NBA combined. So you're talking about uh, money that's off the charts. Uh, and that money should be going back to the athletes and their families, but that's a whole other conversation. But even beyond that, there's kind of an undercurrent of labor rights violation um, and all these other things that are happening in sports that I think all of us should be concerned about. So that's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation. So everybody, this is uh, Miss Jahari Shuck. This week she's holding the Student Athlete Summit at University of Illinois, Chicago. I am Dr. Boyce Watkins from Ball Sports, and until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed,